tonight I'd like to dedicate this talk to my uh, son Austin. He's here in the audience tonight. He uh, has taught me that uh, passion is great, but it's nothing without perseverance. So thank you, Austin. I saw a funny meme on Facebook a while back, and, and it's kind of funny, but it, it's true. And it says, if you really want to get to know somebody, put them in a room with no internet. <laughs> and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's funny because, you know, when you really think about that, there's about three and a half billion people in the world that don't have internet. And so what I'd like to do tonight is take on a journey on what it's going to take to connect those people and what we're doing currently to try to affect that. Currently, more than actually half of humanity are unconnected, and it's about three-quarters of the continent of Africa. Stanford University professor in communications, Jeff Hancock, actually started off doing a study back in 2000, and he did it until about 2008. And what he did was he actually had his students go for two days with no internet. Now, you know, in 2000, maybe even up to 2005, 2006, not that big a deal, you know, probably actually pretty easy. But in 2008, 2009, his students vehemently protested to the extent where they actually went to the president of the university. <laughs> and now, you know, you can imagine, this is 2008, right? So, in, you know, the professor of the university actually called uh, Dr. Hancock and said, um, what are you doing? I, actually, I'm getting calls from parents. Um, you know, students are complaining that they won't be able to contact their friends for social events. More importantly, they won't be able to hand in homework. Uh, they, we obviously clearly they use the internet a lot there. Pew Research, did a, uh, Pew Research Center did a study, and one fifth of all humans, and not just Americans, actually all humans today that are, in, that are connected to the internet, that have connectivity, use the internet almost 100% of their time during not just their employment, but during the course of their daily life. So, you know, from a standpoint of being connected, it's not just a tool that we use to search and do research. It's a lifestyle now. And what we hope to do is bring that lifestyle to the rest of humanity. Because, you know, uh, human beings, we're wired to be connected. From birth, we look for that connection. And as technology has caught up with our innate desire to be connected, We've invented new ways to be connected. I remember MySpace. MySpace was like, I mean, I was awesome. You could have a music on, you could have music on there, you could have a picture on there, you could tell people what you're all about. And, you know, there really, it served no purpose other than to talk about yourself and to, again, connect with other people. And now when you look at Facebook and you look at Twitter and you look at all of the social media apps that are out there, you know, people are, are, are I mean, uh, there's probably 15 people right now I can actually see you looking at your phones right now. Um, you can't get away from it. But you know, it's interesting, Pew Research also did another study. And this was actually just last year. And the study was focused around connecting people that had never had access to internet. And so they hooked them up. God bless you. And during that, during being hooked up to the internet, the first thing these people did was contacted a loved one. And the second thing they did was they shopped. But the third thing they did, because we do have some redeeming qualities as a species, is they started doing research, and they started educating themselves. But the desire at the edge, you know, where internet connectivity ends and a non-connected society exists, the desire exists to be connected. There are towns and cities in sub-Saharan Africa that once they find connectivity, this city starts to grow. Now, what does that mean? How does it grow? Well, it grows first from an educational perspective. Suddenly, there's a huge influx of information that they've never had access to. Now, I imagine there's probably some less than savory researches that are done as well. But for the most part, the human desire to connect is, is fed. And so they start to grow and they start to increase their, their, their education. So that connectivity is a, a, a great asset to bring to those people. And the three quarters of the continent of Africa, once again, is not connected. But imagine if we could connect the other half of humanity. I mean, what does that mean? And I can imagine some pretty amazing things, and I can also imagine some pretty scary things. 
You know, I look at society nowadays, and I'm a 45-year-old man who's running a company and raising, you know, raising a son. He's 21. Thank God he doesn't need me anymore. But that being said, I look at other parents, and I look at other grandparents, and I look at children, and I wonder what's missing. And I think what's missing is the fact that half of humanity has been making the choices for the whole of humanity for just far too long. And I think it's time that we try to find a solution to that. Now, it's great to talk about the altruistic side of it, but let's get into the numbers. Today, the average human being consumes about 500 megabytes of data. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot, but Forbes has told us that within the next five to seven years, that that number will double to a gigabyte. Now, again, not a lot of data, you know, from a personal consumption standpoint, but this is on a daily basis. Now imagine three and a half billion people consuming a gigabyte of data every day. Now imagine what would happen if we connected the other half. It's about seven to seven and a half exabytes of data. Now to put that in perspective, that's all the data humanity has ever created up until 2011. Pictures, research, photographs from space, photographs from the space station, maybe the space shuttle is Dr. Pettit was talking about. But it's interesting, we're creating data today at a far greater rate. And so it's great to talk about connectivity, but it's interesting because the plans that we're making today are based upon current consumption numbers. So I've spent some time at some events talking about 5G and talking about wireless connectivity and bringing the connectivity to the edge. And it's interesting because right now the data supply is far below the data demand already. And that's again with just the people that are currently connected. When 5G is finally connected by 2018, 2021 in that time frame, we will have spent $200 billion a year to connect a system that no longer can serve the demand of humanity. So, What's the point? Network infrastructure is getting overburdened, and we have to come up with a solution. So what do we do? Well, I think that space is not the final frontier. We think it's the great equalizer. And we think it's the great equalizer because it's not as risky as it used to be. It's not as costly as it used to be. 15 years ago, to launch a satellite, you had to have a checkbook that could clear $150 million. Now I know companies that I work with that can launch a satellite for 15 million. So the access to space has gotten significantly less expensive. But interestingly enough, people still want to talk about fiber, fiber connectivity. And there's nothing wrong with fiber networks or radio frequency. There are great technologies that have gotten us to this point. But we've reached an inflection point. And the high cost of fiber connectivity and data intrusion possibilities, and even terrorism, you know, there was an interesting article that I posted on LinkedIn about a month ago that talked about terrorism in the form of state-sponsored acts. And there was actually a picture of a Russian trawler that actually was shown to have the proper equipment on board to cut undersea fiber cables. Now, to give you, put it in perspective, an undersea fiber cable, you probably can't see this carpet I'm standing on, but it's pretty wide. And those undersea fiber cables are about that wide. So this wide from coast to coast undersea. And all it takes is one arbitrary cut, and now an entire continent has lost data connectivity between another continent. Or maybe just a company, because some companies own them. But the point is, is the technology now exists that we can terrestrially bypass connectivity and go from Earth to space, to space, back to Earth. But, you know, I've, 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 I've studied this for quite some time, and there's still some barriers to entry. Currently, there's 1,800 satellites orbiting around the Earth, and it's funny, I was sitting backstage, and somebody was talking about space junk, I think it was. And, and there's a lot of junk up there, there is. There's a lot of junk that works, and it's still junk. But at the end of the day, 1,800 satellites is really not that much. Now, in the next seven years, that number is expected to go to 20,000 satellites by 2023. 
Now, if you put that in perspective, that's a, an order of magnitude increase in, in, in the types of equipment that are flying around in space. And to have a truly globally connected society, satellites are pretty much the final answer. The bottom line also, which you have to take into account, is money's not going to solve this problem. Money doesn't change physics. We are getting to the point where the bottleneck is getting so big that current satellite companies that I work with are provisioning their time on the satellite. And what that basically means is you're prioritized based upon the priority of your need to connect. So some satellites have to sit and hold their data before they can get it down to, down to the ground. And some companies have to wait to send their data to off-peak times. So what do we do? Well, we have decided that we're going to pursue optical communications. And what does that mean? Well, this is what it means. This is our prototype for a space-based 10 gigabit per second optical transceiver that's able to move data wirelessly between two points up to 6,400 kilometers in the vacuum of space to the vacuum of space, or from the ground to space to space back to the ground. And it's fortunately not that big. It works based upon sending light between two points. But the best part about it is it's low cost. It was invented by Jet Propulsion Lab and NASA, not by us. We licensed to sell it. And it's been proven at altitude up to about 25,000 feet. So what we plan on doing is that attaching it to the ISS in late 2019, early 20, 2020, and performing what's called an on-orbit demonstration to prove that it works. And we believe that it works because the guys at NASA and Jet Propulsion Lab told us it works. Hopefully they're right. They tend to be some of the smartest guys in the room, so we're, we're, we're confidence is pretty high. But, you know, let's talk about this scalability of it, because we're pretty sure it's going to work. So from a technology standpoint, the way we deliver this system is we deliver it in small batches first, in first adopters. And what we've been able to do with this technology is find uh, several first adopters to the tune where we've actually sold, pre-sold a little over $25 million in hardware pre-sales. And our joint venture partners have actually gotten to the point where they've got almost $300 million in services pre-sales. So we found that the market likes the idea, they're willing to take a risk on the technology, and they're willing to put their checkbooks with their mouth, where their mouth is. So now what we need to do is we need to scale that system. The best part about optical, as opposed to radio frequency, radio frequency, I don't know, I'm going to probably show my age here a little bit, but I remember as a child driving in a car with my dad, and all we had was an AM radio. And the way an AM radio works, in case for some of, some of you that don't know how it works, there's a dial on both sides, and one's a volume and one's the frequency dial. And it only goes so far down, and it only goes so far up. And it's a great explanation to tell you how current radio frequency systems work. They're limited by the amount of bandwidth they can send and that they can participate in. What we do is we use optical, we use light, which is not limited by those physical limitations. So we step outside of the current norm and we deliver a system that uses light that is bountiful, low cost, reproducible, and scalable. So what we're able to do is take a technology that works 10 times faster, costs five times as less, and take the money and the profit that we make from selling the first units, war chest it, and scale our network much more quickly than fiber optic has ever been able to scale, and much more quickly than radio frequency will ever be able to scale. The way this system works, and to be able to tr deliver true terrestrial bypass, you have to obviously be able to move tremendous amounts of data. Vacuum environments are the best way to do that. Vacuum envi environments contain no atmospheric interference. They contain no human inf interference, no terrorism. And the best part about lasers, based on physics, they're completely unhackable. Now, that's a pretty bold statement, especially at a TED talk. I've had people say, don't say that. But it's based on physics, and it's 100% accurate. You can't hack a laser beam. As soon as you interfere with the beam, 
it collapses, and the data is lost. And any optical scientist will tell you that. So what does it really mean? Well, we take the data from one point on the Earth, we send it up to a satellite, and we shoot it over to another satellite, and we drop it down in another area in less than 150 milliseconds. And that's about as fast as a Google search. And we're data agnostic. We really don't care what your data looks like, how big it is. We change the complete pricing model, too. We now only charge you for what you use. No more monthly fees, no more contracts. Now, I'm not speaking to the cellular carriers out there, but hopefully one day trickle-down economics might help you on that. But really, what, it, what does it do? It levels the playing field. Suddenly, it helps us give the other side of the world a voice. And what if businesses could have access to 3.5 billion new users? We've asked that of companies like Microsoft and Google and Apple. They don't even know how to answer the question. It's such a big number. Amazing, isn't it? Connecting the world with a purpose is OK, and it will give us profit. Imagine companies like Apple becoming $2 trillion companies. But more importantly than that, imagine companies that don't exist. Imagine the next round of Googles, the next round of Amazons, the next round of Microsoft, the companies that haven't been invented yet. What about them? Imagine if we took the rest of the world and put it in a room and gave it internet. Thank you. <laughs>